change, giving liberty. He's forgiving sins, setting captives free. He's breaking the chains, giving liberty. He's forgiving sins, setting captives free. He's breaking the chains. If I don't 
trust it That makes me less of a man Because I can't even walk Without him holding my head without him hallelujah i need him every day every morning every afternoon every evening i can't even walk without him
a moment. Can we entertain his presence? Come on, with every hand lifted, can we entertain the presence of the Lord tonight? Can we offer up that praise of worship tonight? Can we let him enter into this building tonight? Come on now, we serve a living God. We serve a God who went to the cross for our sins and our iniquities. And I just feel like in this moment in time, he deserves more praise than what we're giving him right now. The God who laid down his life for us, I believe he deserves the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate praise tonight. Can we worship him like there's no tomorrow? Come on, this life is just a vapor. Let's step out of our comfort zone. Let's get out of our seats and praise God tonight, amen. praise him. But if we're true God-fearing people in this place tonight, if you say you got the Lord in your heart tonight, I can't see why we're just going to sit on the pew and not worship his name. I can't understand if we say we're, we're blessed and highly favored that we're just going to sit back and relax tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just got a couple of very, very quick prayer requests. Let's remember James St. John. The Riley family and sister and sister James, as our ushers come and we make ready for our offering. So remember those prayer requests. Amen. Would you help me pray tonight? Lord, I love you. God, I thank you. I thank you for breath. I thank you for life. I thank you for letting us assemble into your house tonight, God. Lord, touch each and every one of these requests tonight, God. Heal them, God. Deliver them and set them free, God. Lord, touch each and every person in this place tonight, God. Let them get the desires of their hearts tonight, God. Let each and every person in here be blessed, God. Lord, touch this offering in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You're now in the direction of our church.
lift your hands to heaven and give him the praise that's due his name. What a great, wonderful, mighty God. I feel his presence in this place. Oh, that's right. Go ahead and lift your hands and praise him. React and respond with his presence. Oh, Lord, we love you, Jesus. Oh, yes, that's right. Go ahead and worship him. Go ahead and praise him. Go ahead and magnify his name. Oh, Lord, we love you, Jesus. God, we worship you. We glorify you. We magnify you. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor that's due your great name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, that he has for us. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you've allowed us to feel your presence here tonight. I thank you that you've moved in this place by your presence and power, Lord. Thank you, God, for everything you're doing in this place, for every home, for every family, for every soul. God, I thank you for what you're getting ready to do in this place. I give you my down payment of praise for what you're getting ready to do in this house. Lord, I magnify you for the lives you're getting ready to touch tonight. God, I thank you because everything you touch gets better. And I thank you because you're getting ready to touch your people in this place, Lord. I worship you. I praise you. I magnify your name, Lord. I glorify you. Oh, God. Go ahead and give him another hand clap of praise tonight. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy. I'm going to go to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 4. 2 Kings chapter number 4. Should be familiar to us. It's the same passage of scripture that Bishop Wilson preached on last Sunday morning. Amen. It's good to see everyone in the house of the Lord today. Amen. It's good to feel his presence and his power. Amen. I'm glad I'm in an apostolic church tonight where we still preach the apostles' doctrine, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I'm glad the gospel is still being preached and you can have it. Amen. You can be baptized in Jesus' name. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost in this place. And we are excited about what the Lord is doing. Amen. I want to remind you about camp meeting coming up July the 18th to the 21st right here at Bethlehem Church. That'll be 7 o'clock each night. That's Tuesday through Friday. I hope you're blocking each one of those nights. We do camp meeting once a year, and, uh, and everyone else in the district has to drive here to have it. We get to have it right here at home. So uh, looking forward to that. It's going to be a good time. Uh, might re remind you tomorrow is the last installment of our study guides on the Lord's Prayer and then on Wednesday on Tuesday rather we've got uh, one titled what's right with America and then on, on uh, starting on Wednesday we're going to start another 
another series, so you can keep that in mind. 2 Kings chapter number 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. If you found it, say, Praise the Lord. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door. Everybody say, Shut the door. Shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. That's a powerful four-word phrase. And she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go. Everybody say, Go. Sell the oil and pay. Everybody say pay. Pay thy debt and live. Everybody say live. Live thou and thy children of the rest. Live thou and thy children of the rest. Praise God. I'm going to preach for a little while tonight on this subject. Live of the rest. Look at somebody and tell them, live of the rest. Live of the rest. Lord, I thank you for your people, for your presence, for your spirit. I thank you, God, because we are your church. And I pray, God, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be on me to preach and anoint our ears to hear. God, that you would have your way in this place tonight. I ask you to do a work of the Holy Ghost here. You know what we need, and you know how we need it, Lord. So I pray you do it in the name of Jesus. God, not by power and not by might, but by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, have your way. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're being seated tonight. The books of First and Second Samuel cover about 100 years of Israel's history. The books of the first and second kings covers about three and a half centuries. In the middle of the books of the kings comes a series of narratives about the prophet Elijah and his understudy Elisha. The Elisha series starts in second kings chapter number two and runs until his death in chapter 13. The passage we are using for a text tonight is the shortest of all the stories of Elisha's miracles. It lasts only seven verses. What kind of life-changing miracles could come from a story that only fills seven verses of the Bible? I will tell you, that in June of 1999, I preached a message from this very passage of Scripture titled, Nothing But Oil, on a Wednesday night, right here. 
Last Sunday morning, Bishop Wilson preached a lot better message titled, A Little Bit of Anointing, right here. In 1989, Brother Jeff Arnold preached a message on this passage titled, A Miracle is Looking for a Vessel. I suggest you look on YouTube and try to watch it. On and on it goes that this short passage of Scripture has inspired men of God to preach to God's people. Today I'm preaching a portion of this passage that I've never preached before, that I have never heard preached before. But I felt like God spoke it to my heart this week while I was meditating on what Bishop Wilson preached last week. I told Brother Tucker that I was preaching something from this I'd never preached. He said, I don't know if I should be worried or not. I said, go ahead, I am. I was telling Aaron Yates, I think it was before church, he, he said that I get, that he asked, basically said if I get used to preaching. I told him I get nervous every single time. I'm nervous right now, like Brother Wilson says, by George. But I was meditating on what Bishop preached last week, and I'll tell you that sermons are meant to be listened to, meditated on, thought about, reconsidered, and then acted on. They are milk, bread, and meat from heaven's kitchen for God's people. And the more that I meditated and thought about what we heard last Sunday morning, the more this passage began to minister to my heart. I'm not going to re-preach what he preached last week, except to set up the basic part of the story for those who maybe weren't here or who may be watching on video sometime, somewhere. The living characters in this true-to-life story of Elisha and this woman whose name is never mentioned. This, it's about a prophet of God named Elisha. A woman and her two sons whose names never appear in the scripture that we know of. She's only referred to as a certain woman, her, she, or as a handmaid. Her sons are mentioned but never named. These three nameless people and this one prophet of God Jump off the page, as does the final character of this story, an ominous, unseen person who hangs and hovers over this passage like a black cloud. He's simply known as the creditor. This woman's husband has died with unpaid debts. Whatever he had purchased in his lifetime was now gone, and the debt had been left to this destitute widow and her boys. When it came to the woman's home, she had nothing left. Apparently, everything of value had been liquidated. The woman gave a list of her worldly possessions, and it was a short list. She simply said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Every single thing she had had been sold. Every chair, every table, every bed, every piece of, of furniture, everything she had had been sold. All the implements, every spoon, every fork, every pan, every pot, every plate, every cup had been liquidated to pay the debt. Everything in the house was gone except for one thing. She said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. It makes me wonder about this pot of oil a little bit. There were two things that are possible uh, deductions that we can take from this phrase. She had not anything but a pot of oil. The first possibility is that no one else saw any value in the pot of oil, so they bought everything else, but they didn't buy that. They bought her chair, but they didn't want the pot of oil. They bought her table, but nobody wanted that pot of oil. They bought her plates and her cups and her forks and her spoons, but nobody wanted the pot of oil. They bought all of the rugs and all of the curtains and all the knickknacks, but nobody saw any value in the pot of oil. 
It was either that or the woman who's willing to sell her table, but not the pot of oil. Her chair, but she wouldn't part with her pot of oil. She is willing to sell every curtain, every knickknack, every plate, every cup, every spoon, every fork, every knife, everything in the house. But she said, I'll get rid of everything, but I can't sell my pot of oil. Oh, God. Hallelujah. There was indeed a tremendous need. The circumstances were dire. The prospects were bleak. The situation was grim. The conditions were terrible. The law of those days was that if the debt is not satisfied, the person that incurred the debt would become the slave of the one who held the note. Since this man had died, it would be his sons who would be slaves until the debt is paid. One tragedy had already happened. The woman had buried her husband, and now the second tragedy was imminent. Life without her children was coming. The prospects for a poor, destitute widow were dire, to say the least. This woman had reached her point of desperation. Praise God. Hallelujah. I forgot to start my clock. That gives me something to shout about. I get to start over time-wise. The word desperation. I said a moment ago that she, that desperation had set in. The word desperation means literally a state of despair, typically one that results in extreme behavior. Desperation is a state of despair that results in extreme behavior. Desperation isn't really desperation until it results in extreme behavior. While the woman had time, it wasn't the point of desperation, but now the creditor was coming. He was on his way. Every moment he got closer and closer. The time for dignified actions was past. The time to be noble was gone. The time for decorum was over. There was no time. This was no time for distinction. This was not time to be distinguished, stately, polite, or proud. This was time for extreme measures. It was desperate. It was desperate. Something had to happen for her and her children. Average, ordinary, reserved, shy, backward, quiet was not enough because she was desperate and it's despair that causes extreme behavior. The Bible said, now there cried a certain woman. That word cried in the, in the Hebrew is the word sa'ak or something, not sa'ak, but sa'ak. And it means to shriek. You ever hear somebody shriek in fear or in sadness or in grief? I've heard it a few times when, when something so devastating happened that there was some kind of a primal, guttural sound that came up out of somebody. And it was the most horrifying sound. It's that, that deep down cry from the bottom of a soul that you are so desperate that you don't care what anybody thinks, you don't care what who's looking, you don't care what it sounds like, but something has so affected you that something just bubbles up out of you in a moment that before you even had time to stop it, it came out. That's what a sa'ak is. The Bible said there cried a woman, there was a woman that sa'ak until she shrieked and cried out. She knew the footsteps of the creditor were coming one after another. She knew he was coming down the road. He was going to drag her children out of the home. They had just buried their father, and now they're going to be ripped out of their mother's arms. I'm going to lose my babies. Something has to happen. So she didn't just politely say, excuse me, may I have a word with you, Mr. Prophet? She didn't say, if you get time, could we have a moment? The Bible said she cried, sa'ak. She shrieked. When you get desperate enough, you will sa'ak. You will shriek and cry out. 
at some point, if you get desperate enough, calm, cool, and collected will go by the wayside, and there will be a sa'ak that comes out out of your spirit. Amen. The prophet has this woman that she's shrieking. She's crying out. She is doing sha'ak. And here he is. And this woman, this desperate woman is at his feet. And she's crying out, my servant, thy servant, my husband is dead. She doesn't care who hears. She doesn't care what people think about her. She doesn't care who's looking down on her. She doesn't care who's making fun of her, who's rolling their eyes, who's nodding and laughing and having fun. It doesn't matter to her that somebody in the back is making fun of her. But she cries out, my sons, the creditor's coming to get my sons. I can't lose my, I've already lost my husband. I can't lose my babies too. She does not care who thinks what. She doesn't care what you think. She doesn't care what she looks like. She doesn't care what she sounds like. My babies, I need somebody to help me. This was not a sanitized conversation. This was not a polite conversation. This was not a friendly conversation. This was a desperate woman begging for somebody to do something. I've sold everything. I've sold my bed. i sold my table. i sold my chairs. i sold my rugs, my curtains, my plates, my pots, my pans, my knives, my forks. I've sold everything, and I still don't have enough. And he's coming now to take my babies from me. I can't take another tragedy. You got to help me. She's nearly out of her mind with fear. But she doesn't care what you think right now. Because you're going back to your house. And everything in your home is going to be all right. But she's going to go back to a house without even a bed, and she's going to lay on a dirt floor, and she's going to think about the little footsteps. She's going to look at that dirt floor and see the little footprints of her little boys as they had walked around the house, and she's going to look over in the corner, and she's going to see the little footprint. She's going to look at the wall and see the little handprint that her little boy had made against the wall, and she's going to see the color mark on the wall that she wishes now she would have just not yelled at him for doing it, but now it's too late, and the creditor has come to take her children, and now she doesn't care what you think anymore. She doesn't care if you think she ought to be more dignified. She doesn't care if you think she ought to have more pride. There's, this isn't a time for pride. This is a time for Sa'ak. I need something to happen. You got to get desperate if you're going to save your babies in this generation. The creditor is coming. His footsteps are coming. He wants to drag those babies out of the Sunday school. He wants to drag them out of the church. He wants to take them to the world. You better get a sock inside of your soul that says, God, help me, help me, help me, help me. Calm, cool, and collected praise. That was yesterday. That was last week. That was last year. But now it takes something from the soul. God, you got to help me do something. You got to help me. Oh, God, that somebody in this place would rise with a sock in their spirit that says, God, we need you. I don't care what they think about me. I need your help. Get this preached. The prophet has this woman, Sa'aking, acting out of her mind. Everybody's looking at him. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this woman? What's going on over there? The creditors come. He's going to take my children to be bondmen. You got to help. You got to do something. I've done everything I can do. I've sold everything. I've got nothing in my house pot of oil. Nobody else wanted it. Everybody else thought it was foolish. Everybody else thought it was just a silly old pot of oil. Nobody else thought it had any value. But I understand there's a value in the anointing. And I'll get rid of anything, but I won't lose my anointing. I'll let anything else in my life go, but I won't let my anointing go. 
You can have anything else in my life, but you don't take my anointing from God because if you leave me with a little bit of oil, I got enough for a miracle. You leave me with just a little bit of Holy Ghost and I can turn anything around so you can have anything I got, but you can't have my pot of oil. Take my house, take my car, take everything I got, take every rifle I got, take every toy I got, take everything, but you can't have my anointing. Somebody here, you're letting the devil steal your anointing. He stole your worship. He stole your prayer. He stole your faithfulness. He stole your ministry. You ought to stand up right now and say, you can't have my anointing. I demand that I keep it. I'll get rid of anything, but I won't let you have my Holy Ghost. You ought to praise God right now just to show that you still got your pot of oil. Oh, come on. Hey, we didn't come to have pretty church. We didn't come to have dignified church. We didn't come to have fancy church. We didn't come to have all good, all nice and fancy pretty. We came to have a song. God, this church needs you. Our babies need you. Our marriages need you. Our homes need you. God, we need you. We need you. We need an anointing. I'll get rid of anything, but I won't take, I won't give up my anointing. I got nothing left, God. I got nothing left but a pot of oil. I got no, I've gotten rid of everything else. Oh, let's lift your hands to heaven right now. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to break through in this place. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to break some mentalities. There's some of us, we've been too pretty for the Holy Ghost. We've been too fancy for it. We had not had enough gumption to get up and praise God in so long, we don't even feel comfortable doing it anymore. But God, help us to understand, there's a creditor breathing down our neck. There's a creditor coming down our road right now. There's a creditor getting ready to knock on our door. It's called the world. It's called sin. It's called the devil. It's called carnality. It's called lust. It's called the world. And we better be careful that we don't let our anointing go before the creditor shows up. Mm. Dear God in heaven, I feel something right now pushing me. Oh God, I feel something pushing me in the Holy Ghost. God, help us to get back to old time Holy Ghost church. Not fancy timed not clap on the beat and nothing else happen, but God help us to get a sock spirit down deep in our soul that cries out, that cries out, God, I'm not satisfied just to patty cake with you tonight. I didn't come here just to play Holy Ghost games tonight. God, I came here with a sock in my spirit because I got to have you, God, to save my children from this world. I'm going to tell you, somebody needs to get their sa'ak back. Your walk with God has become too polite. It's become too pop, too, 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 too quiet. It's become too dignified. It's, got too, it's too rigid now. You got God fixing a box, and this is as much as you're willing to do. Sometimes you got to rip the box open and say, God, the creditor is coming right now to take my kids. They don't want to pray. They don't want to worship. They don't want to be faithful. God, the creditor's knocking on my door. I need a sock to come out of my soul. I need you to do something, God. What do you have in your house? What do you got in your house? I don't have anything but a pot of oil. I don't have any, that's all I got left is a pot of oil. One of my favorite verses is found in Mark 16 and 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. I like that passage of scripture. The Lord working with them. I'll tell you tonight that God will work with you, but he might not work for you. God is not your employee. You're not his boss to tell him what to do, when to do it. God will not be bossed around by carnality. 
He's not going to be bossed around people who don't have a prayer life. And then when something goes wrong, they start bossing him because they hadn't had a walk with him in a long time. I'm not preaching to everybody, but I'm preaching to somebody. I understand I'm not preaching to everyone. I know how good you folks are. But I will tell you that God will not be your employee, but he will be your co-worker. He will work with you. The prophet of God didn't reach into his wallet and give the woman enough money to pay the debt. He said, you tell me what you got because God's going to work with you. He's not going to work for you, but he's going to work with you. And if you'll give Give him what you got. God will work a miracle. And she said, all I got left is this pot of oil. And he said, that's enough. Here's what you do. He said, you go home and you go out. God help me. I got to preach this the way I'm, I got to preach it the way I'm feeling it. Amen. He said, go borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. Everybody say neighbors. And empty, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. The man of God said, okay, here's what you do. You take what you got. You take your pot of oil. Take your pot of oil that you got. He said, and here's what I want you to do with it. He said, you send your boys out, and you go to your neighbors, and you borrow vessels. But don't borrow a few. Don't borrow a few. He said, go to your neighbors and get vessels. Listen, you need to be careful who your neighbors are. And I'm talking spiritually now, not physically. You can't control everybody who lives next to you, but you can control who you let close to your heart and close to your family. You need to be careful that you have the kind of people in your life that are willing to be part of your miracle when it's time for God to move. Don't surround yourself with people who don't worship, who aren't spiritually minded. Don't surround yourself with carnal people who are more more concerned with the world than they are with the church. Find people who are willing to be part of your miracle when it's time for God to move. God, help me to put people in my life that love you and worship you and serve you. Help me to have people in my life that love holiness that love faithfulness, that love involvement in the kingdom. I got to be careful who I let surround me because whoever I let surround me, is he going to be part of my miracle or are they going to be part of my destruction? They're either going to help me save my babies or they're going to help my babies be lost. So help me, God, to put the right kind of people in my life. Help me, God, to have the right kind of neighbors. That'll be part of my walk with God. Listen, young people, you better be careful who you are close to. You better be careful who you get close to. Don't get so close to somebody that's worldly and carnal that you have more in common with the world than you do. Get somebody that knows how to shout and talk in tongues. If you're going to date somebody, don't date somebody that just sits on a pew and never moves and never worships. You find your date in the altar. That's good preaching right there. I'll say amen to myself. Preach it, preacher. You got to watch who you let close because they'll either be part of your miracle or they'll be part of your destruction. You got to be careful what you get from your neighbors because when it's time for a miracle, your neighbors are going to be your supply. And that's why people get too close to the world and end up backsliding. Because they're closer to the worldliness and the carnality than they are to the spiritually minded folks. you got to watch who you let close to you because they will determine the magnitude of your miracle. What if she had knocked on the door and said, I need vessels. I've sold everything I got, but I need vessels. The prophet told me I need vessels. And what if they'd have slammed the door in her face? She would have wished that she had never bought that house. And door to door she went. And one by one, if she didn't have the right kind of people around her, she would have not had the ability to have a miracle. That's why you need people that will say, come on, live for God, serve God. Don't get mad at folks when they tell you you got to be faithful. Just get faithful because they're providing your miracle for you. People try to get you to throw the standard of the church and the Bible out the window, you better separate yourself from that person because that person is not contributing to your miracle. Someday the creditors come into your house and going to drag your babies away, and they're going to be right there, and you're going to realize I should have surrounded myself with people that care about my miracle. Oh, God. I got to move on. I got to go. Amen. 
God, help me to find people in my life that are willing to be part of my miracle. That when I knock, they're ready to pray and help. That they're ready to give me vessels, oh God. Not people that's going to make fun of the church and talk down about the preacher and make fun about what's going on. Not somebody that's not going to contribute to my worship and my prayer and my faithfulness. But God, help me to find somebody to be my neighbor. Help me to find somebody to be close to my soul. That'll say, come on, be faithful, pray, live right, serve right, walk right, do right. Come on, God, help me to have somebody that inspires me to live for you. Help me to be careful who I let get close to my heart. Borrow vessels of your neighbors, empty vessels, not, borrow not a few. The size of your miracle is determined by who you hang out with and the level of your faith. How much faith you have for your miracle is going to determine how big your miracle gets. Look what he told her after she borrowed, after she borrowed vessels. I'm, I'm trying to hurry. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to drag this out because i got something I want to get to. In verse 4, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door. Everybody say, shut the door. Shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Whew. Listen, you can't have a miracle in your house and have your door open to the world. He said, if you want to save your children, you have to learn how to shut your doors to the outside influences that would come into your home. When you need a miracle, you got to have control over the things that come in and out of your house. My God, that'd be a good place for somebody to say, preach, preacher. If you're going to walk in the miraculous and the supernatural, you need to learn the art of shutting doors. You can't leave the door open to every kind of music and movie and thing that wants to come in your house, every kind of internet source that wants to come into your home. you got to learn to shut the door. You don't just let everything from the world come into your house. If you want to save your babies, you got to learn when to co close the door and keep stuff out. I'm not going to go on until I feel like you got what I just said. You got to learn the art of closing doors on carnality, closing doors on worldliness, closing doors on lust, closing doors on lasciviousness. Close the doors on this world and learn to shut yourself in with God. Oh, God, help me to learn the art of closing doors because the miraculous doesn't happen with an open door to the world. He said, shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Let me, let me throw this in here. Let me throw this in here. One of the most valuable things you'll ever do for your children is teach them how to close doors. I tell you, I, I, Brother Wilson, I used to get so frustrated. My dad, bless his heart, he's such a cheapskate. I said one time, I said one time how I, every time we went to the store, I always wanted goober, you know, that peanut butter and, 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 and jelly in the same jar. It always looks so cool. I preached that one time. I think Brother Dwayne Williams maybe, or maybe it was Junior. One of them brought me some goober, peanut butter and jelly. After all 40-some years, I finally got it. That's not what I'm asking for right now. But I remember when, when, we, would, when we were home in the summer, my dad, if he was in the house and we wanted to go outside, we barely got the door open before he was saying, shut the door, shut the door, you're letting the cold air out. Shut the door, shut the door. We wouldn't be through the door yet. He wanted to shut ourselves in the middle of the door. I mean, you, you, you could not, you, you, you come in from outside and before you're even through the threshold, shut it, shut it, shut it, shut it, John. Now, we have that beeper on our door, that alarm thing. And I hear that, yeah, that, it was uh, Friday night, man, I heard that door, beep, 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 beep. I'm like, dear Lord, would somebody shut the door? Shut it, shut it, shut it, shut it. I'm going to tell you, one of the most valuable things you'll ever teach your children is how to shut doors for themselves. It's not just because the preacher preaches it. It's not just because Brother Wilson preached it and Brother J. Frank preached it. 
And it's not just because that's what grandma and grandpa did. You shut doors because it's the best thing for you and your life. It's not that you don't do certain things because your mom and dad don't let you. It's because you learned how to shut doors for yourself. I don't go there because I learned how to shut doors. I don't wear that because I learned how to shut doors. I don't listen to that because I learned how to shut doors. I don't watch that because I learned how to shut doors. We need to teach our children how to shut doors in their lives. Because if you want them to walk in the miraculous, they got to know how to shut the door because the oil flows behind closed doors. He said, then, then he said, pour it out. Pour, pour it out and set aside that which is full. Brother Perfecto, can you help me for a second, please? He said, pour it out. He said, pour it out and then set aside what's full. He said, pour it out. Let's not do it over that speaker. I have faith in you, but not in me. All right, it's full. Set it aside. Oh, here's another vessel. And he said, set it aside. He said, set aside that which is full. Set aside that which is full. Because there's a principle in the natural and the spirit world that you can't pour into something if it's full. Once something is full, you might as well give up. Set it aside. Because the supernatural can't keep filling something that is full. My question tonight is, are you full or do you have room for more of God in your life tonight? Because if you don't have room... You may get set aside for someone else that has a sa'ak that says, God, pour it out. Give it to me. Give it to me. If nobody else wants it, I want it. He will set aside that which is full to find somebody that says, God, I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more. I want more. I want more. God, help me not to be so full of this world that there's not room for more of you because he'll fill it up and pour it out. Set it aside. Once it's filled up, you just set it aside. My question to you tonight, did you get all you wanted this morning or do you still have room tonight? Because the Bible said that there's still going to be oil flowing. And when that runs out, there's going to be more, and set it aside. My question is, do you still want more of God tonight, or do you want God to set you aside and get you out of the way for somebody that says, God, I may be a drug addict, but I'm coming to you. I may have problems, but I'm coming to you. I may Look, are you too full to get a Holy Ghost blessing tonight, or are you still hungry for God? He'll set aside. He'll set aside. And he'll just keep pouring it into somebody else. He said, set aside that which is full. Thank you, brother. When they ran out of vessels, the Bible said the oil stayed. This woman, the only thing she held on to was the only thing God needed for a miracle. Just a pot. That's all that God needed. And now, to my message. That was a long introduction. It's a short message. We're on verse 7, the last verse of the passage, so don't get, don't get nervous on me. Then she came, and she told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil. Pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. God worked a miracle, but her job wasn't done. God said, okay, now I've done my part. Now you go sell the oil. He'll make the oil for you, but he won't sell it for you. He'll multiply it for you, but you've got to do something with it. God will give you a blessing tonight, but you've got to do something with the blessing. And then he said, pay the debt. Just because she had a miracle didn't mean she didn't still have a debt. There was still a debt that had to be paid. She still owed. 
And I'll be honest with you, I'll go, I owe God everything in my life right now. I owe him my worship, I owe him my service, I owe him my talents, I owe him my strength. I owe him everything. I have a debt to pay. He's worked miracles in my life, and I still have a debt to pay. Your miracle isn't just for the moment. Here's really what I want to preach about, and then I'll be done, and then something else will happen. The miracle worker knows that there's a tomorrow. The one that has the need is only thinking about right now. I got to get, I got to save my kids right now. But she's not worried about tomorrow. She's not, she hadn't let her mind go that far. She's not the least bit concerned about tomorrow because today is such a big deal that she's worried about that she can't even fathom the thought of tomorrow yet. She's just worried about now. She's worried about the need. She's worried about her present need. If you let your needs dictate your life, then you'll always be living one step away from disaster. Now think about this woman. The Bible said, well, the, the Bible leads us to know that she didn't, let, she didn't let her need set the limit of her miracle. She didn't let the need be what set the limit. She just kept pouring out. And she just kept pouring out, and she kept pouring out. At some point, at some point, she had to know, hey, look at all this oil. Surely that's enough to pay the debt. I can stop now. Why should I, why should I fill up all the rest of those vessels? I can stop now and pay the debt, and everything's cool. But she didn't let the need set the level of what God did in her life. She just kept pouring out and kept pouring out and she kept pouring out and she kept pouring out and the more and she just kept on going and she kept on going and then she finally got to the end and she had filled everything that she had. She didn't leave one single vessel empty. Everything that she had was full. She didn't stop until all the capacity was filled. And then she stopped. And she goes to the man of God. And he looks at all these vessels full of oil. And he said, sell what you need to to pay the debt. And then live of the rest. Lady, God's done enough for you. Not just for today. Not just to save your kids for right this moment, but you got enough to live off of now for the rest. You sell what you got. Lady, you could have stopped halfway and had enough to take care of right this moment, but you didn't stop. You just kept on going, and you kept on going, and you kept on going, and you kept on going. And you had the mindset that, God, as long as it's flowing, I'm going to let it flow because I'm not satisfied with just what I need right now. Amen. I'm going to keep on. At some point, at some point, she had to know, man, I got enough oil to pay my debt, and it's still flowing. And she had the decision to make right then to stop now or keep on pouring out. If she stops, she has enough for today. If she keeps on going, she has enough for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Here's what happens in so many people's lives. They get only enough of God to get them out of their current situation. When God isn't only thinking about today, he's thinking about tomorrow and the next day. And tonight, you can get enough out of this service to satisfy today, or you can keep on worshiping God and get enough to last you for tomorrow too. Amen. I don't want to just get enough victory for right this moment, but I want enough victory to last me. When David jumped on top of Goliath, Goliath was down. He had victory for today, but he had to chop his head off to get victory for tomorrow, and he just kept on going. I'm, I'm almost done. But listen, what happened with Lazarus? Lazarus was in the tomb. He, it, he had been buried. He had been in the tomb, and he had been there so long that he already started to stink, and it was too late. And then Jesus steps up, and Jesus says, roll the stone away. And they said, but he's already been there. He's, he's already starting to stink. It's too late. It's over. He said, just roll the stone away and be quiet. He didn't actually, that might not have been exactly how he said it, but that's how I take it. They roll the stone away, and he says, Lazarus, come forth. 
And Lazarus comes up out of that tomb bound in grave clothes. And he comes out and he says, loose him, let him go. Untie him from all that stuff. And then you don't see, the, the, the chapter 11 goes on a little while longer. And you don't see Lazarus anymore. You don't hear about him anymore. Until you get to chapter 12. Chapter 12 of John says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. All right? Laz everybody say, Lazarus had a miracle. He had been raised from the dead. That was enough for that day. He come out of that tomb that day. And that was his miracle for then. But look what the next verse says. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Martha was always serving. She fixed the supper for Jesus, and look what the next phrase says. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Lazarus, you had your miracle. Why are you eating? Lazarus, you already got your miracle. Why are you still, why do you eat? Why are you eating now? Because Lazarus knew that if he didn't eat, he was going to die again. So he didn't get enough just for one day. He knew he had to live after that day. That one miracle wasn't going to last him forever. So he wanted to get all he could get. And somewhere, this woman, all the way back in the book of 2 Kings chapter number 4, somewhere in that process of pouring out oil, she kept on pouring it out and pouring it out and pouring it out and pouring it out. And at some point she knew, I got enough to pay my debt, but I got, I got more. Now I want more. My sights are higher than just getting out of my mess. Now I want to live for a while. And the prophet said, you've done enough now to live off of. What I want to know tonight, what I want to know tonight, is are we satisfied just getting enough to survive for now? Or are we hungry for enough of God to carry us into the future? That's the real question. The real question is, have I, am I going to stop worshiping now that I've got enough for today? Or am I going to pray through enough to get enough that when tomorrow somebody cuts me off in traffic, I don't act a fool? Uh-oh. Am I going to get enough tonight that tomorrow I'm not going to have a bad attitude? Am I going to get enough today that tomorrow I I'm still close enough to God that I can get all that I need from him? I've come to tell you tonight that God wants us to get enough to live of the rest. Don't stop with the oil until you got enough, not just for today, but for tomorrow. Don't get satisfied with just a partial blessing and a partial breakthrough, but lift your hands to heaven and say, God, I want everything I can get. I want all I can have. I don't want my miracle to die of starvation. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on going. I'm not stopping now. I'm not quitting now. I'm not turning around now. I'm going to keep on pouring out because I know I got a future that I got to take care of. I got another. I got to have enough tomorrow too. I got to buy that table back and that chair back. I got to buy those plates back. I got to get some more curtains and some more because everything that the devil took out of my house, this oil's getting ready to put back into my house. Everything that the, the creditor took out of my home, the oil's getting ready to reprovide. I've come to tell you that whatever the devil has robbed you of, the anointing of God wants to bring it back, but you got to keep on pouring and keep on pouring and keep on pouring. My question is, did you shout enough just to get enough for right now, or are you willing to get enough that he'll restore everything that you lost, everything you lost through the battle? He said, here, take it and live of the rest. God, I want more of you. God, I want more of you. God, I, I got the Holy Ghost when I was uh, just a little boy. I got the Holy Ghost when I was in sixth grade, but I want more right now. I got baptized in elementary school, God, but I want more of you right now. God, I've been in church a long time, but I'm nowhere near satisfied yet. I want more oil. I want more oil. God, I got room for more. Don't set me aside because I'm full, but pour it out one more time. God, don't set Bethlehem 
Slim Church aside because we're full. God, there's still hungry people here. I want more of you, God. Come on, somebody. Is that your heart? Can you reach out to it and say, God, I'm hungry for more. My family needs more. My family needs more oil. My family needs more oil. God wants to give you enough Holy Ghost that you can live, not just survive, but live of the rest. He wants to bless your home enough that you don't have to worry about tomorrow because you know that the anointing has already paid the price. Somebody ought to praise God right now. Somebody ought to talk to him. You ought to stand to your feet and lift your hands to heaven and say, God, let the oil flow on me one more time. Let the oil be poured out on my home, on my family, on my children. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost be poured out on me, God. Pour it out again, God. Pour it out again, God. Pour it out again, God. I don't want to stop with just the point of my desperation, but I want to keep on going in you. Oh, lift your hands all over this place. I've preached a lot of themes tonight. I've preached a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry that I pulled so much out of there, but I couldn't help it. God, God's been dealing with me all week. Thank you, Bishop, for planting that seed in my spirit last week. Thank you for preaching to me. Thank God I wasn't satisfied with just what he gave me Sunday morning, but God had something I, he knew I needed more. So it was poured out. God, I'm going to pour more. I still got room, God. I still got room. I still got room. I need more of you. Lift your hands all over this place. Creditors coming. The creditors coming for our kids. It's coming for our homes. It's coming for everything we have in our house. Sometimes it feels like he's taken everything already. But I got nothing left. But I'm going to tell you, you got enough. Like Bishop said last week, you got enough to be here right now. Maybe you've been touched by God tonight. You got enough for today, but you still want more. Why don't you step out from where you are and lift your hands to heaven and say, God, let the oil flow on me one more time. Let that anointing move in my home one more time, God. I'll tell you, God doesn't want you always to be in emergency mode. God doesn't want you always to be one step away from disaster. God doesn't want you to always be at the point of falling apart. He wants you to have enough to live of the rest. He wants you to lay your head down tonight and know you got a knife anointing to get through tomorrow. He wants you to lay your head down tonight and say, you know what? I know one thing. I got enough oil to live of the rest. I got enough oil to make it. I don't necessarily have all the answers, but I got enough oil. And it all is determined by how much you're willing to pour out. Are you satisfied where you are? If you are, you'll be set aside. But somewhere in this place, somebody says, God, I need more. God, I want more. God, I've got to have more. Oh, that's right, Lord, I love you, Jesus. Come on, let's pray. It's time to be serious with God. God, I want a little bit more. Pour out some more, God. 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 Pour out a little bit more on me, Lord. I need it, God. I need it for my family. I want to live. I want to have enough to live. right. Call on God. Call on God. Call on Him. There's enough. 
There's enough oil for you. There's enough oil. There's enough. 